All right, well, thank you and welcome everyone to another uh, class at Southern Caregiver Resource Center. And today's topic is managing the emotional aspect of caregiving, which we will attempt to do within an hour. <laughs> I know there is a lot. And uh, let me first get started by asking how many of you are caregivers? Okay. How many of you know someone who's a caregiver? How many of you are uh, maybe thinking about someone who might fall into that category as they take care of you? And the reason why I say that is because sometimes people say, you know what, maybe my adult kids should be here. Maybe <laughs> they should learn, right? I mean, it's better so that they have an idea because we're all going to get to a point where we're going to need caregivers, if you think about it, right? We're living longer, and uh, it might be great to be able to share some of this knowledge with them. So I'm going to make it, again, very interactive. Feel free to jot down questions. I know there's some paper here, and uh, I think there are some pens if you want to um, write it down. But before we begin, I just want to say happy Valentine's Day. Uh, it's really exciting to see so many of you here. Uh, we've got some little chocolates, so feel free to eat the chocolates as we're talking about these uh, um, topics today. Okay? So what are we going to cover? We're going to talk about some of the stressors and really explore how to manage some of those stressors because who does not have stress in this room? Raise your hand. <laughs> right? We all experience stress. So I think we can all relate to that. Learn how to recognize, understand, and respond to some of those emotional challenges of being a caregiver. Okay? And then learn of those resources available for you. Okay? We want you to leave with tools. We want you to leave with the understanding that there are things that you can utilize to help you in your caregiving role. Okay? Okay. So first things first. I asked earlier about who's a caregiver, right? And I wanted to share this quote with you because think about this. There are four kinds of people in this world, those who have been caregivers, those who currently are caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. And I often share this in, in my classes because it's really important for us to think about um, that at some point we're going to come across this term and therefore this role. You know, how many of you thought when you were going to be older that you were going to be a family caregiver? Right? So none of us, and I include myself in that situation, right? We kind of just step into that role. And so anybody can guess who, who said this? Former First Lady Rosalind Carter said this. And so caregiving for her has been very, very important. And so I thought this was a very nice quote. Okay, so what is a caregiver? Let me ask you, what is a caregiver? And it's important, I think, to identify where we are in this point in our lives, right? To see what is it that we need. What is a caregiver? Oh, you don't know. That's a great, that's great. I'm glad that you said that. What is a caregiver, right? Every situation is different. The people that we care for are, are have different ways of reacting to the situation. You said support. 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 Okay. So you are that support. But sometimes, as a caregiver, we don't even recognize that we are in that supportive role. And I was myself a family caregiver, and I didn't even realize that that's what I was. Because many of us kind of just say, well, I'll help you. Right? Let me, let me deal with that. Let me get in there. But then if we don't identify with the term caregiving, how are you going to say, oh, let me get that for me since I am a caregiver? Case in point. I was doing a presentation a long time ago, a couple years ago, and I was doing a presentation on caregiving, and I had a table with resources, and this uh, gentleman comes up to my table and says, okay, so what are you, what are you giving away, what are you selling, you know? Uh, and, and we had a, there were a lot of, a uh, bunch of resource tables, and they said, oh, we have resources for family caregivers, and he said, no, 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 that's, that's not for me. And I said, okay, well, do you know someone who's a caregiver? Maybe you can take some info and share it with them. And he said, no, I don't know anybody. But so I thought, you know, well, why are you here, <laughs> right? And he said, well, I'm caring for my wife who has Parkinson. But he hadn't even acknowledged that he was a caregiver, so he wasn't going to take any of my resources. That's why it is important to identify that, yes, if there's anything that you learned today is a youth, especially if you raise your hands, 
you are caregivers and we are here to help you. Okay? So it might mean different things to many different people. It might mean support, that's okay. It might mean support. It might mean even supporting someone who's in that caregiving role, right? Some of us are there because we know someone who's a caregiver, a friend, a neighbor, a relative, okay? Um, it can be an adult child. It can be a spouse, right? It can be a, a colleague, a member of a church group. All of that, there's no, you know, just because you are blood related doesn't necessarily mean that that's the only definition of a caregiver, okay? All right, so I have a picture, not a very good one, but here's a picture of just, you know, it can be any of these people, and I even include the baby. And the reason for that is because when I was in that uh, caregiving role, I was caring for my great aunt who had dementia. So if you think about that, she was my grandmother's sister, and I was her grandniece. So it's like if I ask my niece, who doesn't have any kids yet, that when she has kids, her kids are going to take care of me. Right? <laughs> so you never know what roles you're going to be stepping in as, as you uh, become family caregivers. So in San Diego County, there are more than 650,000 uh, family caregivers providing nearly $7 billion in unpaid services. And the reason why I want to share that with you is because, let me ask you, how much do you get paid as family caregivers? Zero. Zero, <laughs> right? <laughs> you don't get paid millions and billions? <laughs> right? You do it, why? Why do you do it? Because you have to. Because you, you, you what? You love them. You love them. Your insurance, your resources have run out. Your resources have run out, so now there's no other option. Somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to do it, right? Step up to the plate. Absolutely, you step up to the plate. So again, what you're doing is a very noble thing. It's very commendable that you are stepping up to this role because it is not easy. You know that, right? Yeah. Okay. So now that we know that we're caregivers, now what? <laughs> Well, where do we go from here, right? Lots of chocolate. Feel free to start with that. Okay. So there are different types of caregivers. And the reason why I want to mention this is because there are ways of expanding your network of support and thus your network of care. It doesn't just have to be you. Okay? So it can be people who are helping you full-time, part-time, or long-distance. So start thinking about this, okay? So you have a little piece of paper here. Start thinking about if you are the full-time caregiver, right? If you do this 24-7, <laughs> your, your head is going like this, yes, 24-7, every day, who else can help you part-time, right? Is there somebody that can come on the weekends, in the mornings, in the evenings, once a month, once a week, right? Long distance, do you have friends or relatives that can maybe come in a couple of times from out of town and give you some respite, right? So start thinking about who those people are and jot those names down. Okay, I'm going to do a little exercise later. Because if you don't do that, what's going to happen is if you are just keeping this uh, role to yourself, your caregiving situation is going to be become very um, stress, stressful for you, and you're going to feel the burden of that role that you're in, right? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. How'd you get a picture of me? <laughs> <laughs> I visualized it and I put it in there, right? That's many of us. Many of us are doing that. And if you can't identify what that is, then that's stress. <laughs> so then we really need to label the stress. Because this is what I tell my children. If I don't know what the problem is, I can't help you. And they're little, but they'll tantrum and they'll scream and they'll shout and I can't help you because I don't understand what the problem is, right? So if we can label our stress, then we can do something about it. And it's okay because we're human, okay? Physical. So tell me, what kind, what signs of physical stress do we feel? In back and shoulders. Back, shoulders. Mm -hmm. Where, where else? Lack of sleep. Okay. Stomach. Stomach. Headaches. Yes. Headaches, right? You're walking around like this, like the whole weight of the world is on your shoulders, right? So it's easy for us to identify stress. 
The reason why I say this is because as you're going through your caregiving journey, if you start feeling those signs of physical stress, then that's for you to stop and deal with that. Because if you don't, what's going to happen? Really going to get sick. And what we find is that caregivers end up getting, like you said, sicker because they're not taking care of themselves. So now you have two people who need caregivers instead of just one, right? Emotional. What are some signs of emotional stress that we feel? Crying. Crying. Crying sadness. Depression. Overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. Anxiety. Anxiety. You don't even know where to begin, right? It's like, what do I do? Whereas before it was really easy. Oh, I just need to do this, this, and this. And now it's like I can't. I can't even figure it out. So identifying those emotional stressors are important. Behavioral. What is it that we do when we are very stressed that is portrayed in our behavior? If I tell Pam something and she's like, what? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> right? She's very snappy. She must be stressed. Right? When people tell us, wow, you're biting my head off. Right? You're really short with me. What else do we do? Lack of sleep, overeating, undereating, right? Maladaptive coping mechanisms, right? Drinking, right? Maybe we kind of do things that we shouldn't be doing. But that's how we deal with it, and we shouldn't. We, we need to identify. Social. How excited are you to go out with friends when you are so exhausted and so stressful? So then what are people going to start doing? It, isolation. Isolation, right? Well, what is your name? Me? Yeah. Oh, actually, I, I want to ask you. We'll see Susie. <laughs> Susie. <laughs> Susie, um, we're going to stop inviting Susie to go to the movies because she's always tired. She never wants to go. She's always giving us excuses. She's always complaining. She's always complaining. I don't want to hear it. Right? <laughs> So then what's going to happen to Susie? She's going to stay home and she's going to become isolated. And then that's going to kind of be a negative uh, cycle, right? We don't want that. Okay, this is what we don't want. So it's very important to identify that. Okay, so what does that mean? <laughs> we need to take some important steps okay, for ourselves. Remember that there are things that we cannot change, right? The person has dementia. For example, we cannot change that. There is no cure at this point, right? We can only manage some of the symptoms, some of the behaviors. But we can improve how we approach things, right? The problem is still there. How am I going to approach it? So then we need to find a balance, okay? And the way we find a balance is we need to understand more and more about the situation, right? So let's talk about this. What is, what is it that, that you're caregiving for someone who has what? I mentioned dementia. What else? Parkinson's. Parkinson's. Stroke. Stroke. Autoimmune disorder. Autoimmune disorder. So these are things that none of us can control, right? And we, we don't have a way to make things better. So then we need to understand what it means. How is it going to progress? What are some of the treatment options? What doctors can I see? What can I do that would make it better or more comfortable? How do I manage that behavior, right? And that's for the person that you're caring for. Now, how about for you as the caregiver? What organizations are out there that can help me as a caregiver? Hint, hint, right? What are some support groups out there? Are there some counseling uh, therapists that I can talk to? Right? So you're arming yourself with all this knowledge so you can better understand and respond to that situation. Okay? Now, I have here a needs assessment exercise that I want to share with you. And earlier, I talked about the people that you might help to expand your network of care, right? So here's a list of things that time, family caregivers often have to do, right? What am I missing? 
What activities that you do am I missing here? A break. Break, respite. Oh, right here. What else am I missing? Doctor's visits. Doctor's visits, yes. Pharmacy assistant. What else? Entertainment. Changing the TV channel. Changing the TV channel. <laughs> right? Companionship. What else? What else would you need to help with as a caregiver? I know this list is like bills. Bills, financial, right? Financial with paying the bills and maybe acquiring money to get the bills paid, right? You talk about lack of resources sometimes, right? So now you need a special bathroom and special handrails. Mm -hmm. You were gonna say something? A, a, a person to talk to. A person to For share, you. A share, somebody to share the feelings yes. of all of this that, yes. that is kind of judgmental that will say, let me, or just listen. Just listen to me. Right. Don't even I'll try to fix it. it. Just listen to me. That is so important. And I'm so glad you said that because all of us, again, we're all human. All of us need to be able to do that and feel comfortable in a safe space where we can do that. And that's the beauty of what we do here is that we get it. We work with caregivers all day. That's what we do. So there is no judgment. There is no, well, you should have done it this way. It's your situation is unique. But having someone to listen to you is important. I'm going to share a little story. When I was the caregiver for my great aunt, my brother was long distance. So I was expanding my network of support. And I told him, your role is going to be to allow me to call you once a week so I can do just that. Don't try to fix it. Don't try to explain it. Just listen to me. Let me vent. Be a friend. <laughs> right? So maybe you can identify, find a friend to vent, <laughs> right? That can be your homework. So next to these things, the list, I want you to write down three things that you find the most important at this point that you would need help with. If I came to you and I said, what would you like me to help you? What are the top three things you would like me to help you with? What would they be? Write them down, okay? Write them down. I know you probably have like 20,000 things that you would like me to help you with, but I'm only offering three. <laughs> so write three things. Got them? And next to these items, these tasks, right? So you can, you can use these if you like. So if you, you think that these top three are your top three, then write those down. Next to these items, these tasks, write the name of someone who you think might be able to help you. Notice how I'm using my words carefully here. You, they might be able to help you. You don't know that, I used to have to ask them, <laughs> right? So if I say meal prep, and I'm gonna ask one of you to help me, right, I'm gonna ask, and she says, oh, you know what? Cooking is not my thing. I would love to help you, but I just, that's not what I do. I can't really do that. Then I know I'm not going to count on her. Right? And I'm going to keep looking for people until I find someone who's going to fulfill that role. That's your homework. Okay? So again, make your list of all the things because you don't want to be the only one to do everything. You want to expand your network of care and support. And it's okay if somebody says no. Why is that? Why is it okay? You don't want them. Right? Why are you going to force somebody to do something they don't want to do? So if they say no, then be grateful that they're being honest. <laughs> because then, okay, that's fine. I'm not going to count on you. Because then when I really need to count on you, you're not going to be there for me. Yes. But sometimes they're not available. Uh huh. For example, if they cannot help me physically, they can help me with money to pay meals and wheels. Yes. Or you read my mind. <laughs> yes, that's exactly it. Or and you. Yes. Absolutely. And that's actually 
how you start increasing your network. You see that? So it's not just you doing the cooking, but maybe somebody can pay for Meals on Wheels. The person's still going to eat. And they're going to get companionship because that person's going to sit there and listen and, and, and visit. And that helps you too, right? That's a great suggestion. Okay. So can we agree that this is homework and you'll mm -hmm. do it? Yeah? Okay. So not asking for help. Why is it that caregivers don't ask for help? And I myself, you know, I include myself in that. Why is that? We don't want to bother anyone. We don't want to bother anyone. How are we going to feel if they say no? How are you going to feel if they say no? We are the right. super caregiver. We can do it all. I am in this role because it is my duty. Right? I don't want people to judge me. I'm guilty of thinking I'm going to do it correctly, and my sister is not. <laughs> She's probably watching this right now. Good. I said. <laughs> Exactly, right? We fall into that trap. What is the worst? The person cannot make the coffee the way it's supposed to be made. You either teach them or it's coffee, right? It's not a big deal. So you can allow other people to help. And that's what happens is if we do all the things that you mentioned, then we become the sole caregiver. And again, all of the burden of caregiving plus if you're working if you have children and then your needs are not being met because you've got to do it all right so we are here to make sure to that you understand that you don't have to do it all okay that we can ask others and I just wanted to share this that this is also another reason why people don't ask for help caregivers specifically not knowing how to ask I need to ask you a huge favor I don't know how to do this now, mind you, I really doubt that people might say yes if you say, hey, I'm going to leave mom with you for the week. I'm going to take off, right? That might be a little challenging for people to accept, right? Difficult. But maybe what we do is we say, okay, hey, since you're going to the grocery store, do you mind picking up extra milk and eggs and veggies and meat? And then I'll pay you. And then that saves you a trip to the grocery store, right? But having those ready made asks can be helpful. So now I want you to write down three, and I'm sure you can write down more, it can be your homework, quick asks that you can ask other people to help you with. Now I mentioned groceries. What else can people do for you? If you break down the big task, she mentioned having somebody pay for Meals on Wheels, right, for, for home meal delivery. What else? How many times do you have to go to the pharmacy and get prescriptions filled? Maybe somebody can do that for you. Or even better, there are um, companies that deliver medications. Uh huh. That which is great. I remember using that. That was wonderful. Um, so that can be something that you do. Did you want to say something? I just want to, I've been a caregiver uh, progressively 20 plus years, Parkinson, and working now. Mm -hmm. Had cancer, people don't want to offer that help to you. You know, like the siblings of my husband, I never hear them offer help, and, and they know exactly what you need, what what they need. And you know, uh, my my um, sister-in-law lives three, four blocks down. Mm -hmm. I have not heard them offer anything. So, so you so can do two reaction. things. Wow. <laughs> So it's oh, true, yeah. and, and I was guilty of that too. I had a cousin that I would get upset because she wasn't offering yeah. to help with my aunt, help me. And I got to the point where I said, well, I'm just getting upset. Yeah. She has no idea. Maybe what I need to do is be very direct. I need you to help me with picking up her prescription. Can you do that? And if she says no, then I know not to depend on her. But if she says yes, then that can be a way that she feels involved and you get the help. Sometimes direct communication is the best way. Yeah, and, and, and the family's avoidance is of conflict is one of their, one of their issues. Yeah. Stay away. 
And that's why having a quick list of easy things that people can do for you might help. They might not want to be taking care of the person, but they might be willing to take care of little aspects of the responsibility. Okay, so these are all things. I mean, have you felt some of these things in your caregiving role? I mean, there's maybe some fear. You don't know how to best offer the assistance. Maybe there's some anger or resentment in families and dynamics, and even the person that you're caring for. Uh, guilt. Oh, I should have done this better. I should have done this differently. Those are all very normal. Yes? Sometimes the patient wants just you. Yes. They don't want anybody else. Yeah. And that puts an added burden on you because then you can't do anything else, right? So if that person just wants you, then that's why you need more people to help you with other things, right? Maybe things that, yeah, so maybe you're, somebody else can help you do laundry and, and pick up and do the gardening or do the, you know, landscaping or whatever it is so that you can be with that person. I have three brothers and and my mom just wants me to do, you know, shopping with her, doctor's appointment, and then one of my brother lives almost around the corner of her home. Oh, are you coming? I don't have even eggs. Like, yeah. But I have my backup. <laughs> <laughs> you brought her in. When that happens, because it, it often does that that person just wants you. You can do a couple of things. You can, again, get other people to help you, or you can be very honest and say, Mom, I love you. I am here to take care of you. I want to help you. But there are some things that I just need to do as well that I have responsibilities to. So while I am taking care of this thing, so-and-so is going to help me with this. And it can be a gradual thing. Maybe you do it, you know, an hour in a day or once a week so they can start getting used to other people and it's not just you. And you can even say, they're helping me. I'm helping you, but they're helping me. And it's also how you reframe it. Right? Okay. So asking for help. We're in this asking for help phase, right? It's important to make sure that we, not everything is a priority. So we really need to think about how we prioritize. We don't have to clean and cook and do the laundry and, and do the landscaping every day. Maybe you use paper plates, right? Seeking advice is what you were talking about, having someone to listen, have a support network, network emergency backup. Who can I call in case of an emergency? How many, how many of you have pets? Who is going to help you with your pet if you have to run to the emergency room? Maybe you can. That maybe that can be the neighbor's help, right? Hey, neighbor, if I come and tell you that I have to run to the hospital, will you please watch my dog or cat or whatever and, and feed him? Okay. Enjoying time with a friend is just as important, right? Connecting. It's, it's important for us to socialize and be involved in our lives. It is our life, right? We've got to be involved with it. Okay, so you've seen this before, right? Yeah. What does that mean? Take care of yourself, right? You cannot take care of somebody else if you don't put on the mask first. So you have to be healthy. You have to be strong. You have to be well, so that's why um, you got to remember the best way to be an effective caregiver is to take care of you. So this is how we're going to do it, okay? Have you heard of the SMART goals? How many of you like to, what do you do for fun? <laughs> right? Kind of a question. <laughs> as long as it's social and in moderation, that's okay. Um, what do you like to do for fun? Dance. Dance. Mm -hmm. Do you go to like a club or a dance a class? Studio. A studio. Yeah. How often do you go to? Well, not right now, but I'm trying to get back. In not right now because you're caregiving, right? Okay. So you're putting that away. Uh, so, yeah. okay. So how are we gonna make, bring it back to you? I have to prioritize. Right. So 
that how often? Schedule. Exactly. Put it in your schedule. Yeah. So if it's once a week for an hour, yeah. Do it. Once a week for an hour at this time on, on this day, I am going to dance class. So I can socialize, I can do some exercise, I can forget about everything, right? Put it in your schedule and find someone to help you. Remember that list? Socializing, right? That person's going to help me come to my house, take care of who you're taking care of, and you're going to use that time to go. But you need to do it, okay? What else, can, what else do you do for fun? This is a fun group. This is Come fun. on. This is fun for me. Good, good. Okay, well, let's talk about this, right? We have classes all over the county. This one technically is once a month. I feel like I'm plugging it now, right? It's once a month at this time <laughs> here. Um, so you already know that once a month there is a class on caregiving where you're going to learn things and you're going to get connected. You might even get connected with other people who are in the same situation that you are. Right? Kind of like a support group. So then you know that during that time, you need somebody to take care of that person. Or you need to find a way to come here. Okay? So that's in your schedule. That's in your mind. Right? So you, I think you're getting it because all the goals that you have given me are simple. How many of you would love to fly to Hawaii every weekend? I would. Can we? Nope. Yeah. Not financially possible or time, right? But that's not simple. I mean, it's simple, I guess, if you're going to do it once in a year, but not every weekend, right? The things that you were talking about are simple. Reading a book, walking, going to the beach, having coffee with a friend. Those are simple things that you can do. They're measurable, right? It's not like, well, you know, maybe when I grow up, I can go walking on the beach, right? No, you can go now. I can just drive over there and, and, and walk to, on the beach. It's attainable, right? If I schedule it, I'm going to do it. Probably, right? If there's a higher probability that I'm going to do it if I schedule it than if I don't. It's realistic. Again, that's why I gave you the Hawaii uh, trip option because that's not very realistic, whereas those things are. And it's timely. There is a time e ending, right? It's only an hour. It might be two, you know? But it's not going to be forever, and it's not going to be, I don't know what time it's going to be done. I can't plan around it. You know it's going to be an hour in travel time. So this is also your homework, so that you can take whatever activity that you have that is pleasurable, that is, that is something that kind of takes your mind away, to do this. Now, I'm going to ask Maricela if she can hand out the, the paper here because I want to go over this list. And all of, the, all of your caregiving situations are very different, I'm sure, right? Your circumstances are different, your family dynamic, um, the person that you're caring for. Some people are more receptive to being cared for than others. Um, you might have a bigger support network. In your personal lives, others might not and feel all alone. So does everybody have one? Okay. So what I want you to do is I want you to take, uh, look, take a look at the, at the beginning, at number one. It says don't take the behavior personally. Okay, especially if the person has, let's say, dementia or Parkinson's. It's very difficult, you know, to, for us to recognize that it's, it's the disease speaking. It's not the person. Yes. And the Parkinson patient needs their medication on time. Exactly. And you need to be able to follow certain, you know, structures when it comes to, to certain um, conditions. Excuse me. But, yeah. How, how do you not take it personally <laughs> when that person is It's hard. And he is like, he knows you better than anybody, so he knows which buttons to push. I'm not really sure it's all the niche, but... I'm just saying, how do you not take it personally when it hits your basic core? It is. And actually, one of the things, I'm glad that you mentioned it, because the role reversal in caregiving adds additional stress. If you are now the caregiver to a parent, it's almost like you become the parent. He's not living. And you're the child, and they're the child, because you have all the responsibility, 
they don't, but they don't want to let you have the responsibility. Right. So it's this tug of war, yeah. right? So then you, as the adult child, <laughs> as the caregiver, <laughs> have to recognize. You said dementia. No, we'll start. But okay. So if it's something like dementia, if you're noticing his personality, his personality isn't changing, then you can do a couple of things. You can re remember that it's not that person, it's the disease speaking, and there's nothing you can do about it. There is no cure. You can step away and have somebody come in, part of the list of things, right? You're going to be the, what, interceptor, <laughs> right? You're going to be the person that when I'm losing it, tag in. I need you to go in. I need to take a breather because I just it's, it's getting to me. Uh, you can redirect. My aunt would say, you are not my niece. Because she remembered this eight-year-old niece of hers. I was this woman that would come into her house and make her take her meds and make her bathe and make her, you know, all these things. I was not her niece. So what I had to do is I had to remember it's not personal. It's a disease. So what I need to do is, that, okay, so I'm not your niece. Okay, that's fine. Yes, I am... Okay, so I've never done anything right in my life. Yes. No. Okay, perfect. Got it. And you just and you just move on and redirect. Because there's no point in arguing with a person, especially if there's dementia involved. You're not gonna make them recognize or realize things different than what they have going on in their mind. And so you're just gonna be hitting your head against the wall. But you know better. You know that you are you. <laughs> I knew I was the knees, but she didn't. So what's the point? Right? There's no point in arguing. Okay, I'm this woman that comes in. And other times she would say, uh, even with my brother there, oh, you know, how come he's not here visiting and he was right there next to her? So he would feel bad because he would come from out of town to visit her. So then I had to explain, don't take it personally. She doesn't know who you are as an adult. He sees you as this, you know, her nephew was this little boy. So then you're just this new person. Hi, nice to see you again. I came to visit you. And you kind of almost take like a different persona. And then you kind of avoid the grief. I know it's not as easy, but that's one, a couple of ways that you can handle that. But I want to add something. Uh, mine is Parkinson's, so it's not dementia. There's also a point in time where you have to observe that uh, the person can take in something, and you have to set that boundary. Mm -hmm. See, uh, you know, I overdid that enabling, but mm. I found out that, yes, you can tell that person that, no, you can't yell at me whenever you're mad. And and, and so I found out that much later mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that if the person still can um, accept some of those boundaries, and when you have to speak your mind, yeah. that boundary. And that is and that is that delicate balance, right? Because yeah. yes, you have you want to be respected, right? You're doing this person a lot of good, a lot of service, and you take it personally. It hurts, right? That the person's yelling at you, or mm -hmm. you know, is belittling you, or whatever. And it, it, that's normal for you to feel that way. So identifying those emotions is important. And then just say, you know what? I don't appreciate you talking to me like that. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me in a nicer way? Mm -hmm. I'm here to take care of you. And you can only do that so much if the person is not being receptive. At some point, they're either going to recognize that or they're not. Or they're seeking treatment. My husband yeah. is going through therapy. Exactly. So, you, so then you might know, this is not working. I need yeah. to take a different step. Yeah. Okay. There is no clear way, right? I wish I could give you a, a manual that you can say, oh, when this happens, switch to page 53. You know? <laughs> You're going to have to do a lot of trial and error. Okay, so we talked about accepting key, uh, things you cannot change. Three is communication, right? Being patient. If I could buy bottles of patience from Costco, I would. Um, it's very difficult to be patient, right? When all of these things are happening and our emotions are at stake, right? Um, be an active listener. And I say that because you know your care receivers best, right? So they might be verbalizing something, but maybe they're not verbalizing many other things, like you're saying, right? 
maybe you're noticing things that they're doing and therefore they're speaking to you through their actions but you know that person so you know what that means and so then you can figure out what it is that they're trying to communicate with you now if the person's not very verbal then of course you have to do more active listening there's a lot of communication that's happening when we are not being verbal right it's our nonverbal communication so we really have to know, what is that person trying to tell me? Um, again, another, see, 3E, avoid criticizing, correcting, arguing. Sometimes it's pointless to, to do that. As right as you are, as wrong as they are, it's not going to help you, right? So if you need to walk away from that situation, do so. And like I said, maybe tag somebody in. I need a break. I need a breather. I'll be back. Cooler help hands, right? Okay, so we talked about what is the behavior telling you? 70%, more than 70% of our communication is nonverbal. So Pam is like this right here, totally taking her issues <laughs> like that. But if she's like this, looking at me, what is she telling me? She's bored, bored right? She's yeah. not, but I'm just picking at her. So she's telling me that she's not saying it verbally. So if, if I were caring for her and she's sitting in a corner like this, huh? Maybe I need to engage her in something else, right? Maybe I need to give her an activity so that she's not bored, and then it becomes a problem. So then you kind of know what, what to expect. We talked about, uh, oh, number C, where it says keeping the pieces in mind. Now this is the key for you to manage some of those uh, negative behaviors. Is there a physical condition that is causing the person to react the way that that they're reacting or act the way that they're acting, right? Are there is there pain that they might be feeling? Is there an infection? Is there a, a, a urinary tract infection that they're not telling you about, right? Is there a change in medication that is needed but they're not telling you about? Maybe they didn't take them at, or maybe they took them, and now it's counteracting. So you need to become almost like a detective, okay? What is are there physical complications? Are there, and, and I is the intellectual changes. So is there some sort of like memory cognitive decline? Are you noticing more dementia-like symptoms, right? Are, are there, is that person forgetting? Oh, what is your name again? I forgot, right? Hmm, interesting. You know exactly who I am, I'm your daughter, right? So that can be a red flag. Emotional. This we see sometimes with a lot of people. Now again, we all talked about getting sad and depressed sometimes. But when it keeps going and going and going, and there's no way to snap out of it, it's a problem, right? So if that person is constantly feeling depressed or sad or even commenting on being isolated, then there's something else going on. Um, sometimes, you know, I remember with my aunt, she would say, I would want to take her to an adult daycare center where she used to go to, or it was actually next to a, like a senior center. And um, she said, no, I don't like going there. And this was early on when I started taking care of her. Why not? They do activities, all your friends are there. She's like, no. You've been going there for years. No. So it took me a while to recognize that a lot of her friends had died. And that's where they used to hang out. So to her, it was a negative reminder. And here I am trying to push her to go, but she wasn't telling me that. So then I had to figure that out. And I had to find other ways to keep her um, socially interactive. Uh, capabilities. So are they not, no longer able to do the things that they used to do? Like walking. Like cooking. Like even, you know, getting into the shower and doing this to get into the shower. Or their vision is changing, right? And they don't recognize um, what is on the floor, right? What color are your bathtubs? White. white. What color is the floor? White. Color are the walls? White. So if everything's white, I can't see, I cannot differentiate between the lip of the bathtub and I might just trip. So now I'm scared because I hit something but I don't know how high that is. And I can't tell you that. Right? So it's going to take a while for you to figure it out. Environmental. This is a key one. 
if the environment is constantly changing or it's changing to the point where it's uncomfortable, the person might be reacted, reacting negatively, right? So case in point, you're at a party or a get together in your house where the person lives with, you know, you live with that person. And here come all these friends and family and the care receiver is sitting on a corner and is upset. Why do you think that is? What could be happening? It's a gathering, right? It's, it's a happy and too much, stimulus. too much stimulus, right? Too many people, too much noise, too much talking. It's loud. It hurts my ears, right? But you don't even recognize it. You're happy that people are coming to your house for this party and, get, and gathering, right? So that can be an issue. What is the environment telling you, right? Shadows. You know, if it's the light is not appropriate, then that'd be okay. So I keep seeing this thing in the corner. I'm scared. It keeps moving, and I move, and it moves. What is happening, right? Um, social. Their interactions with people might cause some issues, like you were saying. Hi, Dad. I'm your daughter. You're not. Yeah, I came. I just flew in. I came to visit. Happy birthday. You're not my daughter. And then it's like, oh my God, I flew in from so far for, to be here for your birthday. You can't even recognize me. So that can have negative uh, implications when you're visiting, right? Nobody expects that. So again, figure out what is happening to those behaviors by using this key. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, the problem solving plan. So identify the behavior. What happened before the behavior and what happened after? So that you can figure out, is it medication related? Is it environmental? <laughs> is, it, is there lack of food? Is it too much food? Have they taken a nap? Huh? Um, that's why you have the pieces. And then try different response. If this doesn't work now, maybe you can try something else. So as caregivers, we're carrying this invisible toolbox, okay, everywhere we go. And everywhere we go, depending on the situation, we might open the toolbox and when we figure out, okay, I'm gonna use this tool to, to fix the situation. I'm gonna redirect. It's not working today. Okay, um, I'm gonna have somebody else tag in. It's not working today. Okay, I'm gonna change the environment. Not working today, okay. And you just keep going until you find something that works. You never know. The next day it might work again, and now you have something that you can kind of go to, right? A lot of times, how many, those of you who are caring for somebody, uh, difficulty with, uh, at mealtime? Showering. Bath time. How do you deal with that? My mom's to the point where, like, all her memories are, say, you're, are in the trunk of the tree. The leaves are fallen. The lungs are off. So what she remembers is everything that happened when she was young. Mm -hmm. And I say, remember we went, remember when we used to go and play in the rain? And we would go outside. And I have to get in the shower with her. Mm -hmm. And we'd make a game out of it. Perfect. And, of course, my nephew, who was my Help her caregiver is not going to get in the shower with my mom, mm -hmm. and I said, "Put on some drops. Yeah, it really doesn't matter. She's eight. She You're going to go play in the rain anyway, right? <laughs> if we, if she goes and plays in the rain, it'll work. You know, like one out of five times. I'm so glad that you said that because that is your tool. Right. That is the plain play in the rain tool that you use for Otherwise, shower. It's scary. Yes. I'm going to drown. Why is there water on me? It's I want to be hot. Here. It's a yeah. small space. And you're right. It is all white. And if we don't want to just put a rug down. <laughs> be careful what kind of rug, though, so you don't want anything to yeah, slip. Like um, you know what I might recommend in that case? Um, you know those stickies? The, the yeah. put, like, try to cover the, the space with those stickies because then they're, they're non-slip right. grip. But then they, they have flowers, some that are flowers or fish or something, and maybe you can just put them, if you have a top, put them all along the, the face of the top or inside. I'll just to differentiate 
Yeah. And then you can always remove like them. Things you just don't think about. Yeah. Um, okay, so the next the next side, and I'll make this uh, quickly, but some response strategies for you, okay? Stay flexible, patient, and calm. I know it's easier said than done, but just remember um, what you're doing is a great thing, and that person is, is just going through something that's incredibly difficult. So just try to remember that. Can um, I add yes. Uh, um, I'm trying to learn how to be more compassionate mm -hmm. because I'm very patient, but 20 years plus, 10 years of going through this, patience is gone. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to learn myself. I, I thought I was compassionate, but I'm losing my compassion. Uh, it's hard. You're, you're human. And like you said, 20 years, you know, a lot can be eroded in 20 years. I think what you need to do is start with yourself. You know, it's it kind of goes back, how would you like others to treat you? Right? If I, if I were in this situation, how would I like somebody to treat me? And that kind of will stop you, right? If you're really upset, that's why taking a break is important. Recognizing when you're starting to lose it. So that you don't lose that, it's it's a fine line between that and compassion. So then, if you kind of take a break, decompress, and then come back, now you can be a little bit more compassionate because now you're from the taking it from the perspective of that person. So again, you being in check of what those emotions are and dealing with those emotions is important. I'm, I'm a two-time breast cancer yeah. survivor. Out of this whole thing, so. There's a lot of um, help, my own personal help and sacrifice. And but you don't want to jeopardize that. that. No. Anymore. So you need to take a break. Yeah. You need to take a break. Especially when you're finding that it's becoming a difficult situation. Mm -hmm. um, so again, you can read through these response strategies. For the caregiver, again, you are a very important part of this equation. What you're doing for the care receiver it's unbelievable. It's wonderful. So what we need to remember is that as a caregiver, you know, there are a lot, there's a lot that's happening for the care receiver. And you are the one that's having to figure it out. So be patient, be kind to yourself, be compassionate, like you were saying. You're human. Okay? Um, ask for help and accept help. If the person's not offering help, remember, give me homework. This is what you can help me with. These are little things that you can assist me with so that you don't have to do it all and therefore feel so overwhelmed. So if you have different people with different jobs together, they can help you. Okay? And then I really want to make sure that you read the last part where it says take care of yourself. And this is kind of like a little bill of rights, okay? I have the right to take care of myself. It will enable me to take better care of my loved one. Become knowledgeable about the situation, ask for help and accept help, seek professional support, accept that there are things you cannot change, plan ahead, and take time for yourself. So I know that some of you are connected to our organization through some of these resources. But if you're not, how many of you have heard of SCRC or are familiar with our services? How many of you are not? Okay, so we are a nonprofit organization that focuses 100% on the family and caregiver. We are the lead provider of caregiver services throughout San Diego County. Everything we do is for the caregiver. And by helping you, you're better able to help the care receiver, okay? We, uh, you call us or you visit us or you, um, you know, come here and we can connect you to a care manager, which is, um, we call them care managers and they are uh, family consultants, uh, licensed clinical social workers, master's level clinicians who will work with you one on one as, as much as you want, as often as you need in the place that it's better serves both of you. So if you cannot come here, we can meet you at your home, we can meet you at Starbucks, I can meet you anywhere where it's convenient. 
Okay. If you need specialized information, some of you talked about Parkinson's. So let's say, you know, I don't know, the doctor says they have Parkinson's. I don't know what that is. We have a lot of uh, books. We have a library of books and videos, um, as well as fact sheets that you can access and all free of charge. Uh, we have counseling sessions, six free counseling sessions with a professional staff member, a counselor. And all we do is talk about your caregiving situation. So this is where you can really vent and really explore what's happening and they can help guide you. Legal and financial, so we work closely with uh, attorneys and law firms that focus on elder law. And so if you are in that situation where you're trying to figure out, okay, well, I think I have to place mom, do I need to sell all her assets, what do I do? So they can um, help you with that, and we will pay for that initial consultation. So you can have all of your questions ready and ask them. Respite care, which is what you're talking about. So um, you had talked about coming here on a monthly basis. Let's say you say, well, I, I would love to come here for each class, but I can't because I need to have somebody care for my mom. If you're a client, we pro can provide that respite care. Somebody will go home uh, to where your mom is and care for her while you are here or to one of our conferences, or it just depends what your needs are. Uh, support groups, we have a lot of support groups throughout San Diego County, and we have a list of them outside if you, when you leave, you are interested in that, English and Spanish. Uh, education and training is what I do, so we do a lot of topics uh, regarding caregiving throughout San Diego County. So if you're interested, make sure you connect with us to see what other topics are coming up. Employer resources, we recognize that a lot of caregivers are working full-time and are caregivers full-time. So we want to make sure that we are available to go to an employer. So if you know of someone who says, I would love to go with you to the class, but I have to work. Well, maybe there's a way that we can go to that employer and say, we can come in during lunch and offer these classes to your employees. We can condense them in 30 minutes while they're having lunch and, and have a discussion. Um, so this program right here, I have my colleagues in the back, it is very specific to caregivers who are caring for someone with Alzheimer's. And it's a great program because it's actually a, a class, series of four classes, that gives you those tools to deal with someone who has Alzheimer's, memory loss, or dementia. So they talk about, they kind of break it down at each class, and at the end, the idea is that you are a little bit more empowered to be that caregiver to that person that has memory loss, dementia, or Alzheimer's. So if you're interested in signing up for this class, make sure you see my colleagues in the back, they're raising their hands, Rosario and Maricela, um, and, they'll, and they'll sign you up. And then this is Operation Family Caregiver for military and veteran family caregivers who have um, a, a unique situation where they might be caring for someone with a TBI, PTSD, some sort of physical disability. Again, it's a program where you can sign up for and everything is free. It's for you. I also encourage you to go to our website, scrc.care or caregivercenter.org, <laughs> and there are a lot of um, caregiver tip videos, uh, podcasts, this class, which is live stream, so you can always click on it again and, and watch it, or share it. You can share with others who weren't able to come here. Um, oh, yes, thank you, Marisela. And actually, if, I don't know if you have any more, but there is a... A, a workshop that we're doing February 23rd. It's in El Cajon, and it's making the most of your doctor's visits. So those of you who are having to care for someone and take them to the doctor, how do you maximize that time? Uh, so that is, um, that is a workshop that's happening February 23rd. We would encourage you to sign up. We have flyers in the back if you're interested. Any questions? I just have to add again. Um, you guys have been excellent, and my lessons learned is I was a provider, so I was working. I did not prioritize Southern Caregiver, even though I knew about your services. I was doing counseling, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, but the services that you guys provide is a must for any caregiver. So I would encourage you all to take advantage of that service. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that yes. because I think one of the things that we want to make sure is that if you, if you leave here today is that you'd know that we're here to help you.
that we are here to care for those who care for others. That is our motto. But we really are here to focus on the caregiver. And sometimes you need that someone to guide you through this caregiving journey because it's difficult. It is hard. And I remember thinking, you know, I was a strong woman. I can go online. I can pick yeah. up a brush. I, can, I got this. I can figure it out. But when it comes to that emotional roller coaster that we're on as caregivers, sometimes you need a hand to guide you. And that's what we do here. So you don't have to do it alone. Okay? Where do you get your funding? We actually get them through different sources. The majority of our funding comes from uh, grants. So the county has given us several grants, recognizing us as the lead uh, provider for caregiver services. Some of them are also state. We do some uh, fundraising, but not a lot of fundraising. We really focus on a lot on our core services. But everything we do is, is free, because we don't want to add an, another burden to caregiver. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, yes. Thank you. Marisa, you're awesome. So she also has a um, another flyer for the upcoming classes uh, that will be held here monthly. Different topics. Um, what is the next one? The next one is? Um, the aging process, what is normal, what is not, Wednesday, March 14th. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for coming. You. And make sure you sign up so that we can let you know when our classes are coming up. Okay. Okay. So, 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 so,